right. Welcome. Um, let me get situated here. Here we are. We are in uh, part eight of, of our Encounters with Jesus Bible Study. And since I think the people on Zoom or the person on Zoom has moved to the live stream, I'm just going to close this. That way I don't have to look at it. Um, but we're going to begin with our foundational verse for the study and then the promise from the Old Testament. We'll have Olga read it for us. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. When I seek the Lord my God, I will find him if I seek him with all my heart and with all my soul. And so last week we looked at Jesus' encounter with Satan. Um, and it was insightful to us. Let's see if I've got that. It was insightful to us because Jesus models how we are to be when we encounter Satan, and we do every day, whether we realize it or not. And so Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit, and we saw how the enemy approached him from three vantage points. He approached him from the physical, from the soul, and from the Spirit. And so before we move on, we're going to touch on these three a little more deeply um, and ways in which that the enemy works in our lives in similar ways. And so in the first temptation, we'll have Olga read it for us in Matthew 4. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. So Jesus had been without food for 40 days and 40 nights, and then it says he was hungry. Well, is that like kind of an understatement? <laughs> Can you imagine how good bread would have looked to him um, in that moment? And so this temptation arose out of a normal, natural need of Jesus' basic humanity. It was just a need that his body had. There was nothing wrong that caused it. Um, it was just simply because he was human. And so the enemy will come to us in the same way. He attempts to keep us in a place of vulnerability. And we can be vulnerable when we're weary and hungry and stretched and stressed. And so now, granted, Jesus was led into his wilderness by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, we saw last week, chose to be fasting there. But often we make choices that put us in a wilderness and, or it's an unnecessary place of vulnerability. And Satan loves this. And so we're going to read here um, from an excerpt from The Good and Beautiful God by James Bryan Smith and Olga. Holiness is essentially wholeness, a life that works. Sin is dysfunction or sickness. The number one spiritual sickness of our day is hurry sickness. We are constantly in a hurry because we have overloaded our schedule. When we lack margin in our lives, we become tired and lonely and joyless. And this seems to invite temptation. We need margin. Margin restores balance and restores our soul, thus increasing our capacity for joy. Joy is a bulwark against temptation. Margin and holiness are related to one another in very deep ways. So since margin and holiness are related to one another in deep ways, it's important for us to be intentional about creating margin. We want to create space for rest and fellowship because when we lack these things, it robs us of our joy. And did you notice that Brian said joy is a bulwark against temptation? Jesus wants us to be filled with joy. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. And of course, the these things that he had just spoken, we'll go back and look at those. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. 
If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So Jesus had just explained to them that we experience his joy when we abide, when we choose to abide in him and we remain in his love. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be made full. And so Jesus desires to make our joy full. And as we abide in him, he actually plants desires within us, his desires. And he wants us to ask him for them. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. And so as we delight in him, he plants the desires in our hearts. So it's important to mix our desires with prayer. And as we do that, as we commit our way to him, he will then act and he will fulfill those desires. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. And Jesus delights in us when we make time for and pursue the God-given desires that he has planted within us. And so what is he calling you to pursue that fills you with joy? And what is crowding that out? Whatever it is, is the work of the enemy because he wants to keep you from those things that bring joy because then you're going to be more vulnerable and susceptible to his ploys. And he will even try to make you feel guilty for pursuing what brings you joy because he wants to rob you of these things. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give life in all its fullness. So it's important to invite Jesus into how you schedule your time. Ask him what you are to do and what, what you're, uh, who you're to do it with. Um, prayerfully consider what you say yes to and what you say no to and put Jesus in front of all of that. As I keep saying in this series, put him in front of it. Ask him how you are to create margin, the margin he desires for you to have. And don't let anyone or anything crowd it out. Okay? Now, back to Jesus in his wilderness, the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. So notice, though, what Satan was really saying to Jesus. He was saying, Look, God doesn't really care for you, does he? Would he leave you in the wilderness without food or food for 40 days? Would, would he, wouldn't he want you to act upon your power that you have? You know, that is, if you really are the son of God. And so his suggestion is, is that God is either too busy in the moment or too unconcerned or too something to take care of Jesus. And he's even getting him to quest, trying to get him to question his true identity. Does this sound familiar? Does he try to get you to think that God is too busy or unconcerned over your little insignificant life or to get you to question your identity in Christ? This is how he operates, and it is a lie. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So this is Satan's subtle way to get Jesus to act on his own, to be independent of the Father. He's attempting to reverse the priorities of life and to make the physical aspect of life the most important thing of all. But Jesus immediately points to his proper understanding of the nature of man. So Satan's work is always to twist and to distort things and to make things look differently than they are. 
He particularly wants to twist our perspective so that we'll get life out of proportion. Where is he doing that in your life? Where is he trying to twist and distort something and to make it look different than it really is? Where is he trying to get you to an overindulge in some good thing, to twist it and distort it? Well, Jesus immediately puts things back in focus by saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus points out that the deepest need in life is not physical. It never was, and it never will be. Jesus is saying that it's better to die of hunger in the wilderness in right relationship with the God who made us than it is to satisfy ourselves at the cost of that relationship. And so with that, he ended the first temptation, putting everything into perspective, reminding us that we have deeper needs than the physical and that the temporary lack of a physical supply of anything, of something, does not in any way indicate that the God who made us and who is deeply concerned about every aspect of our lives has forgotten us or is unconcerned about us. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So the next temptation is on the level of the soul. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So this is interesting because in the first temptation, um, he was attacking Jesus's weakness as a man. And he was attacking his basic need for uh, physical supply and hunger. Satan cruelly tried to exploit that weakness and make him violate the most important thing. And that was the trust of his father. Well, now he moves to the exact opposite extreme. Satan is basically saying, you trust in God, do you? Well, I tried to get you to move apart from that trust, but I see you really do trust him. Well, that's excellent. Now, let, why don't you manifest that trust? Why don't you put yourself, show how much you trust him by putting yourself in danger. Notice what a powerful, subtle temptation this was because Satan's tactics are always the same. If he can't push you off one side, he'll push you off on the other. And it doesn't matter to him which one it is. So now we're going to do a little reading here from a devotional by Ray Stedman called Christ in You. In a Christian life, there are two extremes, legality and license. And the devil does not really care which one he pushes you into. If he can get you into either one, your life is ruined as far as usefulness for God is concerned. But grace represents the middle path that goes right down between the two. License is lawlessness. It is saying, I'm free to do anything I want. There are no limits to my indulgence. This is license, and it is wrong. At the other extreme, there is legality. Our trouble is that to escape license. Sometimes we rebound into legality. We feel the condemnation of conscience that comes with living a wild, free, untrammeled life, and we react with legality. We impose on ourselves laws, rigid rules, long lists of don'ts which prevent us from doing anything but eat, sleep, and read the Bible. 
There are many who wrongly think that the standards of grace are much lower than the standards of legalism. True Christians, some say, would never smoke or dance or go to the movies or gamble or drink. And since you sometimes see those who say they are living by grace do these things, it proves the standards of grace are lower than those of the law. Actually, the reverse is true. According to God's word, these outward acts are much less serious sin, if they are sin at all, than the inward, vicious sins of the spirit that legalists almost invariably permit in their own lives. Legal standards always are concerned with outward acts. As long as you can keep the outward aspect of your life adjusted to a particular rule or standard, you can consider yourself spiritual. But grace goes beyond the outward act into the heart, and it says the heart must be right as well. The standards of grace are concerned with those inward attitudes that create the outward act. Would you say your tendency is more toward legality or license? Well, we want to aim for a holy balance. Um, and as, as he said, grace represents the middle path that goes right down between the two. So we want balance between discipline and dependence. And we only find that balance when we abide in Jesus. Because he is full of grace and he is full of truth. He's 100% grace And he's 100% truth. And he wants us to be like him. He calls us to be like him. So back to Jesus in the wilderness. Satan then says, you know, you trusted God. So now use your trust to the full. And remember, you have scripture for it. And then he quotes Psalm 91. It is written, Satan says, the angels will bear you up in their hands. While Satan is trying to get Jesus to use his power, or some great display of faith, or some spectacular demonstration. But Jesus puts everything into perspective by speaking truth again. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And so the greatest display of faith is not some spectacular demonstration. It's the quiet trust of the heart that rests upon God um, and, and not just looking at one piece of scripture, but looking in one place, but looking at the balanced truth. Because the most important word Jesus is using here is again. He says, again, it is written. So truth comes from the full and complete account and gospel of scripture. So one truth is to be balanced against another. We don't arrive at a whole until we see it in its total revelation. So this, of course, is the answer to the cults that have been formed, who they'll take one scripture out of here and one out of here, out of context, and then they make their truth. And we see this a lot going on in our day now. But the truth is, scripture will always support scripture. And so that's why Jesus says it is written again. And so it was said by Dr. Lewis Sperry Schaefer, if they persecute you in one verse, flee into another. There you go. (laughs) So now the third temptation, let's go to that and uh, read there, Olga. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all of these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So now Satan moves into the realm of the spirit. So he removes all pretenses and masks and disguises and comes up with a direct appeal to the deepest desire of every human heart a desire that's actually been planted in us by God himself. And that's the desire that our lives are worthwhile, that, that we want to be invested in something of value, 
that we, we have a desire to make an unforgettable mark on the world. And so he was tempting Jesus with that. I mean, who doesn't want this? Satan takes Jesus to a high mountain in some wonderful way. He shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and all the things that would attract the human heart um, and has attracted some to the point of having them leave their families and their positions and possessions in order to gain these things. But Satan says to him, you can have all this if you will fall down and worship me. Now think of the force of that because These kingdoms are exactly what Jesus came to earth to get. He came in order to win the world, that he might be Lord of all. And this is why he came. And and then, of course, this would certainly be a temptation for Jesus to receive all this without ever having to go to the cross. And what would that, where would that have left all of us? But notice Jesus immediately sees through it. He didn't fall for the lies. Jesus knew the truth. And again, he spoke it. Read that again, what he said. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. What Jesus knew is, um, read Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Satan was offering something that wasn't his to give. What a joke, huh? And, and Jesus' reply is almost contemptuous. Be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and obey him only shall you serve. But notice the combination of words, worship and serve. To worship is to serve. And to serve is to worship. And not only was this not for Satan to give, but Jesus was also saying only God can give the value to life that Satan was suggesting he could offer. The kingdoms of this world and the glory of them will never give it. Satan was attempting to offer the deepest desire of a person's life to have a life that's worthwhile, but the truth is only God can give that. Only God. And Satan's trying to constantly tell us he's got something to offer that's going to make us worthwhile, and it's a lie. And so immediately, Satan left him, and the angels came to minister to Jesus. And so as we saw last week, Jesus meets these temptations on the level level of the physical, the soul, and the spirit with the word of God. And it was his weapon. And it is our weapon The word of God is our weapon. We want to daily be in the word. We want to hide it in our hearts. We want to call upon it. We want to claim it. For the word of God is alive and it's active and it's more powerful than even the sharpest sword. It's our sharpest weapon. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning he, he thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So this is very important. Our continuing struggle comes when we are reluctant to take our stand on God's revelation. We can feel the force of the enemy's alluring lies. And, you know, he'll tell us we can gain something by this action or this thought or this attitude he's tempting us with or that if we don't do this thing, we're going to, we're going to, life is going to pass us by or we're going to lose something somehow or if we do it, we're going to gain something somehow, something satisfying. And these are powerful temptations that he lures us with But when we retreat to what God says, when we retreat retreat to the truth of the word of God, then we immediately come to the end of the struggle. When it looks as though we're going to gain by disobeying, our one retreat must always be to the word of God, for this is the revelation of the way things really are. 
I remember Ken Boa said once, you know, I have always regretted disobedience. I have never regretted obedience. <laughs> never. And so it's like, what are we thinking? <laughs> so this is the way to confront temptation, not in our weak, failing human strength, but with the power of the word of God that's alive and active. When Satan finds himself up against it, he turns and flees. He has no choice. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And so we first submit to God because we cannot resist the enemy if we have not submitted to God. We need his power to resist. And then we daily want to put on the armor of God. And the armor has both offensive and defensive aspects to it. The armor of God is any weapon that destroys the enemy's ability to wage war against us. So these weapons include, of course, the word of God and prayer. But you know what other weapons we have? Our forgiveness, (coughs) generosity, (coughs) contentment, truth, a clear conscience, fellowship. Did you ever consider the fact that forgiveness or contentment or a clear conscience that they're actually weapons? Well, they are because when we engage in unforgiveness or when we allow ourselves to wallow in self-pity or distractedness or we live in a way that's wounding our conscience or we isolate ourselves, we are setting ourselves up to be vulnerable. And that is a work of the enemy. We are playing right into his hand. And so we are giving ground to evil spirits when we indulge in these things. And so we're going to read uh, on one of these on the concentration of, of prayer, the matter of concentration of, of prayer and this was an entry out of my magnificent prayer book my, by Nick Harrison that speaks about one of these issues. So let's go ahead and read that, Olga. How shall one deal with this matter of concentration in prayer? In the past, has your mind in any way become passive and under the hold of the enemy? Often this is generally accepted as natural, but everything that comes from the Spirit of God invigorates every part of the being and does not injure nor dull it. Yet there are experiences which leave those who pass through them with no concentration of mind. The reason is that there has been a complete letting go of the mind instead of recognizing that God quickens and energizes it. If you see that this has happened, you can deal with it in this moment without going into the past if you say father if i ever in any way gave ground to evil spirits by passivity of mind i now take back that ground and claim the liberation of my mental faculties because of the victory of christ at calvary But if you insist upon accepting that lack of concentration as purely natural, you will not get deliverance from it. So I don't know if you've noticed, um, when when I sometimes, when I go, this happened to me yesterday morning. So um, I'm sitting down to have my quiet time. And all of a sudden, my mind just starts thinking over there and over there and it gets distracted. And, and I, and I, wait a minute, you know, and I, And this is what he's talking about. And so it's here where I get to say, okay, wait a minute. Now I can let myself go off on those bunny trails. Or I can say, Jesus, I just want to be in your presence right now. Would you help me focus on you? Often when I go in, so for me, I have my quiet time where I'm reading the word and he's speaking to me through the word. And then after I'm finished with that, I'll go out and just walk. And that's when I talk. And then I carry not always, but often carry scripture with me 
so that if I come to the end and uh, he's not giving me any more to pray for, then I go to, I just start meditating on passages on my little three by five cards. But sometimes once I get into the intercessory prayer time where I am praying over some intense strongholds over people, I will start getting distracted. Like, oh, you know, what are you going to make for dinner tonight? (laughs) Or just crazy thing. And it's like, oh, I've got to work at coming back to focus my mind. And so it takes effort to do this. But I have found that when I stop and say, help me refocus, Lord, that then he does. I don't know if any of you experience these things. But (laughs) exactly, I think we all do. But first Peter talks about this because there's a there's a dual, you know, there's our part and his part. Read that, Olga. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. So there's a role we play in preparing our minds for action and then to say, Lord, I put my hope on the grace, which is what? (laughs) It's my definition of grace that I love so much. It's the power of God acting in my life to bring about what I cannot on my own. And when then he, so I'm preparing my mind, receiving that grace that's displacing my distractedness and then the revelation of Christ comes into that whatever it is I'm praying for. And so we want to utilize the weapons that we have, the weapons of the word, the weapons of prayer, but also forgiveness, generosity, contentment, concentration, truth, a clear conscience, and fellowship, because these disarm the enemy. So which of these, as you look at that list, which of these is he calling you to put into play right now as a weapon? Which one? So now the armor metaphor makes it clear that spiritual warfare is proactive. We want to be prepared, ready to resist and empowered to advance into enemy territory because we're in it every day. And Jesus is the victor who calls us to stand on the ground. He has already won and he has won it through his blood. And so as long as we're prepared for battle, We need not retreat or fear the enemy. And so it's wise to pray the armor on every single morning uh, because without it, we're open to attack. And I'll never forget five years ago when I was going through a really hard time and I I had a lunch with Sharon and she reminded me, you know, Laura, put on the armor. You know, you got to put on the armor. Yeah, you know, since that day, I don't get out of bed without putting on the armor. And it just, and I knew that, but she reminded me, put on the armor. And so this is a reminder today. We all know this, but we're just going to go through each piece of the armor. And we want to be remind, we want to remind each other to do this every day. So let's read Ephesians 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So the belt of truth is the first one. And the Roman soldier's belt was used to hold his tunic and his sword in place. And so Satan has forces, they're deceivers. And so the belt of biblical truth will defend us against their lies. And the more we understand the person of Jesus and our invincible position in him, the more we'll be able to stand firm in his authority against the forces of evil. And we don't need to fear the enemy because we are more than conquerors through Christ who gives us strength. And Jesus has already defeated Satan on the cross and we are united with him in his crucifixion and in his burial and in his resurrection and ascension. We're reunited and in his reign. We're united with Jesus. And so um, he has given us his life And we are secure in him. 
And so as we focus on our in-Christ relationship, we ask God to make it not merely head, not theology, but a reality in our thinking and in our behavior. And his word will then abide in us and we will overcome the evil one. You veterans know the one who started it all, and you newcomers such vitality and strength. God's word is so steady in you. Your fellowship with God enables you to gain a victory over the evil one. And it's important then to put on his breastplate, the breastplate of righteousness. So the soldier's breastplate protected his vital organs that would otherwise be vulnerable And so in the same way, we are vulnerable unless we're clothed with the righteousness. And it's not our righteousness, it's his righteousness. And so this righteousness was imputed to us when we, the moment we trusted Christ. And it is imparted to us as we grow in sanctification, as we grow in our knowledge and understanding, as we grow and become more and more like him. And we want to be careful to walk in dependence on his righteousness, not on ours. Not on our goodness, but no, it's his righteousness. So when we fail, we just immediately deal with our sin. We confess it, and we're quick to forgive those who sin against us. But immediately we say, hey, I've, I've got his righteousness on me. And so there's no condemnation, but we immediately were quick to confess. And because if we stay in unforgiveness or bitterness or resentment, again, we're vulnerable to the enemy. And so... We want to just have on his breastplate of righteousness. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. So then the sandals of peace, the soldier's sandals protected his feet and enabled him to hold his ground um, and move quickly because the soles were studded with hobnails. So imagine how he could just, you know, be really agile. And so we have that stability when we have on the sandals of peace. And the preparation of the gospel of peace speaks of the readiness to enter the fray and to share the only message that leads to peace. And that's the message of the gospel. And this peace with God, a reconciliation with God, is the basis for our peace. And when we walk in fellowship with him, when we humble ourselves and we cast our anxieties on him, then we enjoy that peace, even when we're facing adversity. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus so then we want to put on the, take up the shield of faith. And uh, for the Roman soldiers, these were large oblong shields that they would interlock um, to protect them from the spears as well as the flaming arrows. They, w- they would literally send arrows on fire to try to get into them. And so they would interlock these big shields. And, um, and so that's the way we want to be. We want to just put our faith in him, not in our circumstances or our efforts, but we trust in him and he becomes the source of our confidence and our hope. And so we want to adopt a faith stance that reveals Satan as a defeated foe and enables us to walk in the victory that Jesus has already won for us. So we want to be preoccupied with Jesus, keeping our eyes on Jesus, not on the enemy. He calls us to submit to his sovereign purposes even when we don't understand what's going on. We get to trust him. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. The helmet of salvation. Now, a, a wise soldier would never think of going into battle without headgear. And as believers, we want to cover and protect our minds by understanding our position in Christ 
and this includes monitoring our thought lives. Um, we want to reject anything not of him. We want to reject gossip, criticism, immoral thoughts, self, negative self-talk, self-condemnation, fear. We want to dwell on what is true and honorable and lovely. And, and this means also avoiding environments or movies or TV shows or internet sites or books or podcasts that distort our thinking or that solicit us into darkness. And they're all around us, aren't they? And so what instead of, in the difficult times, instead of letting our minds go to our feelings, we want to stand by the faith of the truth of God's word and his goodness and his love and our hope in Christ. And, and when we do this, we can then overcome the negative thoughts, the thoughts of hopelessness and despair, and these come from the enemy. Instead, we look to him to displace them with hope and with goodness. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. So then we have the sword of the spirit, and this is an offensive weapon in our armory, and it's wielding the weapon of scripture, and we're to be aggressive combatants, not passive spectators. The, the sword will do little good if somebody is unskilled in using it, and so to be effective, we want to gain understanding with it, and it requires discipline of being in the Word of God so that we know how to, how to use it. We want to daily invest time um, to prayerfully and expectantly read his word and let him renew our minds. We want to even memorize and meditate on scripture. And this way, when we do this, we're putting on the mind of Christ. And when we know and understand it, the word, we will be able to use it to pierce through the lies and the traps that the enemy's, the enemy's constantly setting for us. And we'll, able, we'll be able to discern the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. If you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. And then we have prayer and petition, and this is another offensive weapon available to every believer. Nothing accomplishes as much as prayer does. And, um, and that's where we lay hold of the strength in the Lord. Through prayer, we put on the armor. Through prayer, we walk by the power of the Holy Spirit. Through praise and thanksgiving, we silence the enemy. And we enter into God's presence. Prayer is the opposite of grumbling and complaining. And, it, and that all stems from a lack of faith. Prayer is from faith. And so we get to persevere in prayer. And the quality of our prayer life will determine the degree of our spiritual vitality. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So Bible study, endurance in prayer, these things require discipline. And so we want to um, continue to trust him and we want to lay hold of our position and on God's promises and we don't want to doubt or be overcome by setbacks but we want to not only pray for ourselves but for others intercessory prayer pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere 
So this persistent prayer, I was reading recently a quote, a reading of, from Watchman Nee, and he was talking about authoritative prayer. And this is prayer that begins in heaven and ends on earth. It's, it's praying from heaven to earth. So it's not praying, it's different than praying upward. It's praying downward. And we use it in spiritual warfare where um, we're, we're actually standing upon our heavenly position that Christ has given us and using the authority that he has given us to resist the works of the enemy and to command the prayer that God, is, that God has already commanded must be done. So this is when we know the will of God and then we're praying downward. We know the will of God and so we're commanding it. We have authority to pray it. Now, I first encountered this kind of prayer. Um, I have a cousin, and she's a prayer warrior. And when I was going through a really hard time, I would call her, and this was my first exposure to this commanding prayer, this praying downward, this authoritative prayer. And it was like she would be praying in the Spirit, and she would pray about things that I I hadn't told her had happened. It's like she just had this understanding and she was praying in this way that I'd never experienced before. And that's what he calls us to do. It's a, it's a praying downward. And so when we pray for a particular matter, sometimes he clearly shows us what his will is. And it's then that we can pray with authority. And um, we can pray because we do have, this is a mystery, but we have a heavenly position that was given to us when Jesus ascended to heaven. And so Christ is in heaven, and so are we. Our spirits are with him there. We are seated at the right hand of God, and it talks about this in Ephesians. He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. That is our position. and We have a position of authority, and he calls us to use it. And so Satan tries to get us to forget our position in authority um, and that he wants us to forget our heavenly position and because it's a position of victory. And so as long as we stand in that position, we are victorious. And then lastly, a super powerful weapon of our warfare that we have is praise. Satan cannot inhabit the praise of God's people. And so make your life one of praise and lift up your heart to him with gratitude no matter what is going on because he is worthy of our praise. Let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your glory all the day long. Shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him, singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever. And his faithfulness continues to each generation. And now let's read Ken Boa's Transforming Prayer. Father God, I know that I am engaged in a spiritual warfare on the three battlefronts of the flesh, the world, and the devil. These forces are opposed to your rule and authority, and the most chilling of them is the flesh because it is internal. I affirm that the good I want, I do not do, and instead practice the very evil I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but the sin that dwells in me. There rages a warfare between my deepest self in Christ and the sinful remnant of what I was in Adam. But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, you have given me the power of your Holy Spirit so that I can put to death the deeds of the flesh. 
Let me never trust in my own devices and desires, but only in your power. Amen. Amen. Okay, so any thoughts or comments or questions? Sherry, you want to woman the mic? (laughs) Who would like to begin? Janice. Something Something struck me at the very beginning of of your talk, and I was thinking about the lawlessness versus the uh, legalism. And I think so many times in our lives, in in little ways, and then we can see it in other people, um, they think once they've accepted Christ and they hear about this freedom that we have in Christ, they figure they can keep on doing whatever they want to do. And, you know, and when I first, you know, became involved with Christ, that I felt the same thing. And then all of a sudden you realize that this is deadly and it's not working. And so you jump all the way over to the become extremely legal Mm -hmm. And that never lasts Mm -mm. because you can't maintain the legalism because you have jumped over Mm -hmm. the grace. Mm -hmm. And they mistake lawlessness for grace, Mm -hmm. and it's not the same. Mm -mm. And so there's this whole weakness, and then there's this fluctuating Mm -hmm. between the two of them. One extreme to the other. Back and forth and never resting in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly the work of the enemy, trying to keep us doing that, one side or the other. And then judging whoever's on the other side. (laughs) Yeah. And so it's this balance that is a real, the closer you get to the Lord, when you're abiding in him, it's like there's certain things you just can't do. And you don't even have a desire anymore. It just dissipates. And that's the kind of inside-out change that's genuine. Um, And so that's what we're looking for. That's exactly, um, you know, what I've, well, been praying and um, trying to live with for many years is balance. I think that's the hardest thing. And, uh, you know, it reminds me of what you said about grace is the middle ground mm-hmm. in between you know the legalism and mm-hmm. and the uh, licentiousness mm-hmm. and it's much harder to live by balance rather I mean it's easy to have rules mm-hmm. and live by them and then you end up feeling really pious and look down on people who don't and everything it's much harder and you have pride, to live by yeah. balance mm-hmm. and you truly do or I have learned I truly do need to live with um, God showing me what that balance is, what right. the truth is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember one time in my life when I was very concerned. It was, you know, before maybe a couple of elections ago. And I prayed, oh, for several years, just that God would show me the truth. Because I realized, you. <laughs> I mean, I really realized you can't depend on what you hear and mm-hmm. the news and things like that. And it was confusing. Mm-hmm. And, and also talking with other people. Because other people don't necessarily right. give you the truth. You know, so <laughs> I spent many years praying just that God would show me the truth. And, and he, he, I mean, I have to keep asking for it in, in certain situations. But he has given me the, the peace that I can get it from him. Mm-hmm. I can get the truth. I can get the wisdom I need from him. Right. Yes. Who else? Dale. When I was a teen, I used to be so annoyed by my mom who used to always praise God and just everything. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. (laughs) And 
it's so funny because, and I, and she said why. It was, like you said, because the enemy cannot inhabit the pr- praises of, mm-hmm. you know, the Lord. And um, it's so funny because now I'm like her age, <laughs> and I catch myself doing it mm-hmm. all the time. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure my daughter, is like, who's not a Christian, is like completely way more annoyed than I ever was. <laughs> But it's just kind of weird. But what a different, when you have the attitude of praise, even if something's going really awry or something's frustrating, I mean, when you start grumbling, it only makes it worse. And if you can turn it to, you know what, thank you, Jesus. I'm just going to trust you. I mean, it changes everything about it, and then it's easier to tolerate it, whatever it is. And so it is good medicine, and it is a discipline. So it's not something that we fall into. It's something that we must be intentional about. Yeah. Don. When you were talking, Dale, it made me think, I became a Christian when I was 13. And I didn't know how to walk as a Christian. And my youth group had a bunch of bad kids, bad, quote, unquote, And so they would go to see these concerts. And I said, well, if I go to the concert that I'm not saved. (laughs) And I would go. And they would say, what are you today? Are you a Christian today? Oh, switch. They called me switch. (laughs) Switch. But it was terrible because there was not discipleship. Right. And, you know, I mean, what you said is so helpful because it is. I love to know the rules. But I also like to break them, so it's better for me. (laughs) It doesn't work so well. (laughs) But what you said, it's really knowing Jesus. So Mm -hmm. a lot of the things you've shared help me because it's we have to be close to him because Mm -hmm. I can be a people pleaser and, Mm -hmm. oh, everybody thinks I'm good at this. But really, Mm -hmm. then that's pride. Mm -hmm. So it's just being close to him, and then he'll show you. Mm -hmm. And I was... um, praying about those things in my life that are not honoring to him or that are keeping me from a closer walk because my girlfriends and I who have retired recently were like what does God want us to do well I said okay Lord show me what to get rid of and show me what to add and Laura knows I have way too many things in my schedule (laughs) that I'm trying to know which one is going to stay and what's not going to stay but I love just your encouragement to stay close to Jesus Mm -hmm. So when you said you had your little, your little cards on your walk, is mm-hmm. that your memorization mm-hmm. scriptures to memorize? Mm-hmm. So when I, whenever he gives me, um, and the, the, this really started when I was walking through that difficult time, the end of life with my folks, and um, he just would give me certain passages that would just feed me. So I would write them down. I'd write them in my journal, but then I started, I, I want to carry these with me and I would memorize them but then there started to be so many it was kind of hard to keep track of them all (laughs) in my memory I mean I could get started on one and then I could say it but I couldn't remember Um, so I started making three by five cards and now I've got I can't even carry the whole stack with me on the walk (laughs) I've got now two stacks like that of three by five cards of verses that he's given me and I put the date when he gave it and then it recalls my mind to that thing that he then actually eventually um, moved in. And so now when I walk with those cards, and I haven't added a new card for quite a while, the cards would come out of turmoil and trial, and then he'd give me a verse, a word. Um, but when I, I look at them and I'll start, I, can, I have the hardest time remembering the reference. That's like the worst part. But once I start on the verse, then I can go right into the verse. And so I use them as starts, and then I um, quote them. But they take me back to his faithfulness, you know, and and they're just, they feed me, and they remind me, and and they're just wonderful nuggets. Many of them are out of the Psalms. I was kind of camped in Psalms for (laughs) a long time. Get up in the middle of the night and just... Okay, I'm going to the Psalms. <laughs> um, but he is just so, fa- the word is so powerful. And if there's something like kind of bugging you or whatever, it's like when I go to those and I start filling my mind with those, 
it just dissipates. It's like he is so bigger than this. And I'm just, it changes my whole thinking about it. And so I like mixing prayer with his word like that. And I have some um, handbooks that are praying scripture back to God. And I love that too. Yeah. So I do that daily. Yeah. Other, Other thoughts or comments? Yes, Joni. She's coming. So I used to think that I could not memorize scripture. And then um, I've done a lot of uh, studies with Beth Moore. Mm -hmm. And she has a reputation of memorizing books. And I always thought, that is not possible. Mm -hmm. And then I read a devotion by her that she said, you have to ask him Mm -hmm. to give you the power Mm -hmm. to memorize the scripture. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that was convicting because... Mm -hmm. I was trying to do it myself. Mm -hmm. So um, it does take a long time. Mm -hmm. And for me, I have a goal. If it takes me six months, if it takes me a year, I just say it over and over and over. So it's the again and again Mm -hmm. that puts it in Mm -hmm. and the review Mm -hmm. because I have to review over and over, and the miracle is the Holy Spirit does give you the remembrance. He does. So I encourage you mm-hmm. ladies mm-hmm. to ask him, Yeah. which is what we're supposed to be doing. Yes. So what we get to be yeah. doing. Yes, anyway. that's, a, that's a good. Olga. Excuse me. Uh-huh. Can you remind us, it was years ago, you were telling us a way that you memorized scripture, yeah. and it was... I will something. tell you. I'm going to tell you. So, in fact, when she was talking, I thought I'm going to share this. So it goes back to when I was a little kid, and I had this German piano teacher, <laughs> Mrs. Grecken, <laughs> and she would, she would, we had recitals we had to play in several a year, and she wouldn't let you take your music up to the piano, and I was just horrified by this, but she wouldn't allow it. You had to memorize your piece. So she taught me how to memorize, so we'd start with just one little I can't even remember. What is it? What's the first measure? measure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> One measure. And you'd play that three times without hesitating. If you hesitated, you had to start over and play it three times. So once you could play it three times, then you added the next measure. Then you play those two. You have to play them three times without any hesitation. And sometimes it'd take a long time to get to doing that. Then you'd add another measure. And same thing. Then from the beginning, those three measures, three times with no hesitation. And you do that all the way until you finish the song, and then you've got it memorized. Well, I do that with scripture. So I'll start with just the very first, like, three or four words, and I say them over and over and over again until they're just easy. And then I'll add another three or four words, and then I'll say the six words. And I say them until I do it without hesitating three times, and then I'll add a couple more words. And it puts it right in there. And I can memorize a path. And I do think... Some people, like my husband, his favorite memory verse was John, I think it's 337 or 437, and it was, Jesus wept. (laughs) 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 Because he has a hard time memorizing. And and I would I told him this method, you know, and but then I would sit with him. I remember we were on vacation, we were sitting on a beach, and he wanted to memorize a fairly lengthy passage of scripture and he was just so determined and it was really hard for him and I'd say just take three words now say now three more words so I think some people it comes a little easier than others but he now that he has that passage memorized and he is able to but it does come harder for for him but I will say that method has really helped me but then as Joni says um then you can't just do it, have it memorized, and then not repeat it later. I I find repetition is important. So every so often I go through. Now, four wonderful passages that I love 
um, are those transforming prayers that Paul prays from prison. And I've memorized all four of them. I gave those of you who've been around a while, I gave you cards with them. Um, and those, before I get out of bed in the morning, I pray the, all of those prayers just because I, that I don't even want to start the day without praying those prayers, and they're amazing prayers. And, um, and so things like that that you can memorize and asking him what Joni says is so key. Lord, help me to be able to retain this. This would be a downward prayer because it would be his will for you. You know it's his will for you, so you can pray it with authority. I command that I can memorize. So, Lord, I'm going to claim it. And then you just do it. And then how fun it is. It becomes fun. I mean, it, it just was such a joy to me because then he gives you, I want you to memorize this one. And, it, and it's like, well, this is right from him. This is right from the God of the universe wants to give me a word. And so it just, this is a delight. And, and then it's personal because it's for me. And I claim it. I stand on it. I cling to it. Sometimes it's clinging. And so, yes, it's, it's just a beautiful gift that we have. And again, the enemy does not want us to do it. He will try to snatch this from you when we walk out of here. He'll try to keep you from doing it because he knows the power yeah. Who else? Let's see how we're doing on time. I kind of taught longer today. I, d- I don't want to do that. I want to kind of keep it to 40 minutes, but couldn't really cut anything out. <laughs> so, um, But it is 11.13, so we have a few more minutes. Gloria. Um, I, I love where it says, I have hidden your word mm-hmm. in my heart. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you think about that, it's such a treasure Mm-hmm. You know, and one of the things that I really like being here is to hear the word of God spoken to me. Mm-hmm. It's like I hear ones that I know. Mm-hmm. I hear new ones mm-hmm. that I want to know. Mm-hmm. And it's it's like fairy dust. <laughs> it is. And so that's why I pack this with scripture, because. I then can be confident that even if whatever I say just goes by the wayside, people will be fed because they're scripture. And I love having it come into the eye gate and the ear gate. And so you get both. Um, and Olga is this gift that we have. We have Mary Gay. We have some gifted readers God has given us. Um, and it is just such a beautiful thing. And so it is. It's his gift to us. It's really a beautiful thing. Carmen. Oh, I agree with um, Gloria. Gloria. <laughs> Um, uh, I really enjoy hearing the scripture here. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you can read the scripture over or hear it before. And I know that it's been said you're not in the right place at that time, maybe when you heard it a year ago mm-hmm. or whatever. But on um, Matthew's verse where it says, Satan be gone, only God I has the power. But he mm-hmm. doesn't say, I never... I never heard this before. He doesn't say, my father. And he's, Satan is asking Jesus to go against his father, mm-hmm. let alone him being God. Yeah. And it hit me today that I never read it that way before. Yeah. I mean, even though it wasn't said, it's, it stood out to me today that yeah. he says, only God has mm-hmm. the power. Mm-hmm. But really, it's his father. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Yeah. And so... God, I wonder if he was saying God, the triune Godhead. God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, God, is the the one. You know, there's the mystery of the three and the one. And so it it wasn't just the Father, but it was the the Godhead, the triune Godhead. The power that we have in that is an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. Anybody else? Nina? Nina? I enjoyed your your entry into the 
Pathway Press, I read this week. Nina's a beautiful, gifted writer. You know, that is the oddest thing because when I went to write that, I, I knew that I needed to write something, but I didn't quite, the waterfall didn't just spill over. <laughs> and so I was, um, I always send them to Laura here, and I said, if this is total trash, just, you know, Don't delete it. it. <laughs> so le- just let me clarify, Laura Metzger has a beautiful devotional that she sends out called Pathways Press. I've been receiving it for a long time. Right, and, and it's twice you, a year. There's the Lenten, okay. and then the Advent, different times of year. Okay, and so Nina, it's but it's all year round. Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. Nina wrote an ex, uh, she wrote an entry this past week, and it was very, very. Well, beautiful. thank you. Anyway, but anyway, the bottom line there is, I'm thinking, you know, is this a waste of computer ink or what? But, <laughs> um, but I got more response to that mm-hmm. via email mm-hmm. in person mm-hmm. and just. From Jack, from our mm-hmm. pastor. Mm-hmm. I mean, just it was just like that. Okay, I guess it was. I guess it was okay. Exactly. <laughs> but anyway, um, I I have a couple things. One is that Dallas Willard has this wonderful image. He's very good at metaphors, but um, sometimes you have to dig around and wait for them because he's so verbose. Yes, and um, and that's coming from a mouth of like mine. So I'm <laughs> I'm telling you. So, um, but the image that I retained that has always meant a lot to me is that was the vision of being on a very narrow path at the top of a mountain, mm. and wait down to your right is a sheer cliff, and down to your left is a sheer cliff. So you really need to pay attention to being on the path. Mm -hmm. And to the right was the one where um, would be on the side of lawlessness, Mm -hmm. that you're not facing whatever the issue is, and you are condemned if you fall off the path to the right. And if you fall off the path to the left, it's, it's a path of you're trying so hard to do it, and and it's abject failure. Mm -hmm. And so you're failing left or right. So the only place you can be is on this narrow, narrow little path. And I think he has you on your knees crawling through that. (laughs) And it kind of reminded me of a time when um, I was in Greece and in my foolish youth, um, rode a donkey up a hill (laughs) to a monastery and talk about narrow paths holy guacamole it was like (laughs) it was like and every once in a while the donk and it's way up at the top of this you know mountainy rocky path and every once in a while the donkey's foot would slip oh no (laughs) you know and that just make your heart stop so i guess (laughs) yeah (laughs) It was just the, um, you know, it's just that narrow path reminded me. Yeah. But the other one that I wanted to share was um, about downward prayers mm-hmm. and how there was a time when our daughter had gotten married and we were the parents of the bride, so we were jumping through a cabillion hoops. And then, um, then the next marriage that came up was our son, and I'm thinking, great, I can buy a dress. I can throw a rehearsal dinner in Washington, D.C. I can go, and I'm done. <laughs> wrong <laughs> Oh, But um, so as it turned out, it turned out to be a very busy time in my life. And so when I was triangulated into all this other wedding stuff that I had not counted on, I was just like overwhelmed with buying a dress was just completely off the... I couldn't even think about it. <laughs> so I went to Matthew six thirty three, and I said, it says here not to worry about what you're going to wear. <laughs> that Solomon in his finest glory did not look as beautiful as the lilies and, <laughs> and, that, um, and that God would take care of you. So I said, okay, Lord, I'm insisting that your word is true here mm-hmm. because I do not have time to think about this or mm-hmm. what's the best thing or how to do it or even where to go look. I just, I was just like completely in over my head. 
So I started walking around. You know, when I'd be going outside, I'd cast my eyes up to heaven. I'm saying, <laughs> okay, where is this, you know? <laughs> where is this, uh, you know, need going to be fulfilled? And honest to God, one by one, each piece <laughs> came to me in the oddest way. <laughs> and I ended up, I ended up with... Um, needing a skirt with some gray in it. And, of course, I'd go in a store and I'd just survey. <laughs> and, of course, there was not a gray garment in the county. <laughs> and so I didn't know what I was going to do, so I went to my dressmaker and I had her adjust another part of the outfit, you know, that, was, that I had, had received. And um, she looked at me and she said, wait a minute, let me go. And so she went digging around in her archives of fabric oh and my. came out with a perfect piece of fabric <laughs> that went with a piece that I already had. <laughs> and she said, bring me something that fits you. And so she made the skirt without my ever trying it on. It was perfect. <laughs> it was a beautiful piece of fabric. She said, I want you to have it. Oh, my. And, and then little by little, um, I discovered something that had been given to me, which was a black pearl from Fiji, and it was just perfect around my neck. For the, <laughs> I mean, it was just like one thing after the other, so God really... Isn't that beautiful? I mean, it was just like each little crazy thing, and yeah. so I'm telling you, when you insist on God's word, you know, you yes. just go out and look up and say, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I am ready to, I'm ready to receive. Exactly. I love that. It's a beautiful story. Wonderful. Okay, well, I think it's time to close. And so if you can bring the mic up here to Sharon. I'd love to have her close us. I you were <laughs> Don't even give her eye contact. <laughs> I know. She's, she's, as soon as we come to the end, she starts looking away from me. <laughs> you close us so well, Sharon, so please do. Lord, we just thank you for this wonderful lesson today. Thank you for reminding us that there is a middle way that we don't have to fall on either side, legalism or license. And I think that the model that you gave us in that when you were tempted, you referred to Scripture. Satan knew the Scripture. He knew what Jesus could do. And yet, Jesus refuted it by quoting Scripture. And I just thank you for that model. I thank you that we can use that model. I thank you for the lesson. I thank you for the stories. I thank you that she had a beautiful dress to wear to the wedding. <laughs> and I just pray that we might reach out at times when we really need something and ask for it. It's hard to believe many times, but because of that, we don't ask. And I just pray that you will bring it to our minds, that you, well, as we were reminded today, that um, we are at the right hand of the Father, too. Mm -hmm. And I thank you for that. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. And uh, remember our April 4th gathering at Elaine's house. I'll be giving you the address for those of you who... It's been a while since we've been there, and some of you have not. So I'll be giving you instructions and... Um, it'll be a fun day. Thank you, Elaine, for opening it up to us. And so we have three more sessions. I think that's right. And then, or maybe four more. I don't remember. But anyway, you, you got the dates. All right. Thank you.